welcome back. Um, our next presenter I'd like to introduce is Benjamin Fellman. Benjamin goes to Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma, and Benjamin's um, mentor this summer was Mari Tai. His topic for his oral presentation, his title is Abrupt Flash Drought, Investigating Flash Drought Occurrence Over Vital Agricultural Regions. All right. We're gonna start off bright today. Here we go, fresh off the break. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Benjamin Thelman. I use he, him pronouns. And this summer, I've been a part of the NCAR Earth System Science Internship, or also known as the NESI program. And during the course of this almost three-month program, I've been working on a research project with Mari Tai, investigating flash drought occurrence over vital agricultural regions. So to begin, I think it's really important that we understand the major characteristics behind what a flash drought really is. First thing is a rapid intensification of drought-like conditions, where we usually see an increase in temperatures and also a decrease in precipitation over a region. The second is a rapid loss of evaporative water availability, typically in the ground and soil. So we're seeing the ground dry up as a result of these conditions that are occurring atmospherically. And the prime example of a flash drought event that occurred was in 2012. And this is when we really saw research ramp up. Um, Jeffrey Becerra in his article in 2019 examined this event across the Great Plains in the Midwest. And what we note from looking at this USDA drought monitor index from May 2012 and October of 2012 is this rapid transition from non-drought state to extreme and exceptional drought over much of the domain area. So these are the events we're looking after, seeing a rapid deterioration of drought conditions in just a few months' time. The motivation from this project specifically came from a study done by Eric Hunt in 2021, which investigated a large flash drought event over a heavily dense agricultural region of Russia. There were two main keys to this event that were quite interesting to look at. The first one looking at the figure on the left is the timing of this event. And especially over this black box region, um, we note that the orange color is indicative that the flash drought occurred at once over the region. So it wasn't really a prolonged event, it was a simultaneous event that occurred at once. The image on the right depicts the severity of this event, and we note that especially in the western domain of this region, it was quite significant reaching the highest status of flash drought. And so for this project, our motivation was understanding how flash drought occurrence over vital agricultural regions affected the crops here. Are we seeing the timings of these flash drought events impacting crops in various regions of the United States, or are they occurring at times that won't be impactful to farmers and other stakeholders? The other additional motivation for this project actually comes about what we're seeing right now in the United States. So what I have here again is the USDA Drought Monitor Index from June 28th of this year and July 19th, just a three week difference in time. But what we note, especially within the black boxes here seen, especially across Eastern and Central Oklahoma, is this transition of non-drought state into a rapid state of drought across the entire state, where we see that regions that were previously not in a drought are now classified to be in a severe and even extreme drought in just less than a month in time. And so this is what we're really getting at. We wanna focus on these events that are really impactful and that are occurring very rapidly over these regions. As I described before, we have two regions of investigation that we were looking at, and we wanted to use agricultural use kind of as a domain of where we wanted to focus on. And what I have here are the planting um, acres by county for three different crops. The one on the left is winter wheat, the center one is corn, and the one on the right is soybeans. Within each of them, I've outlined kind of the main regions of growth with the darkest greens indicative are the heaviest density of agriculture in these regions. And from these, I was able to select two regions that really exemplified and included the heaviest density of these crops in general. Region one, which includes states such as Oklahoma, Texas, Kansas, and Colorado, encompassed the winter wheat. And then corn and soybeans were encompassed within region two, which included states like Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota. And what was really interesting with this project, so we're looking at such small regions of flash drought occurrence, it was kind of interesting to note how the characteristics may have differed compared to over a larger region, which is what previous studies have done. Now for identifying flash droughts, it's kind of tricky and there've been several studies done. I used one that had been used in previous studies um, from Jordan Christian, who I worked with alongside this project. And we used two different variables in daily status. We used the evapotranspiration and potential evapotranspiration to calculate the evaporative stress ratio. Now during, so to begin with, evapotranspiration basically means the amount of moisture and water vapor that is being released from the ground and plants at a point in time. What we note during drought events is that the ET rapidly declines because there's a rapid loss of water moisture within the soil itself. And as a result, we see the ESR values or the evaporative stress ratio decrease as a result. 
Now these values are put into pen tabs, which are essentially five day periods. And the reason for that is that the ESR itself can be highly variable on a daily basis. And so in order to account for these changes and see them better, previous studies have shown that using the use of pen tabs exemplify and better demonstrate the rapid decreases that we see during the course of these flash drought events. We then standardize the ESR values to create CSR, which is just the standardized evaporative stress ratio. And that allows us to put in perspective as well of how much these changes are occurring based on standard deviations. What I've included here is kind of a time series representing what we're looking at exactly. So for the course of this study, we looked at a 40-year period from 1981 to 2020 of flash drought occurrence. The red box outlines March through October, which is the time period that we were looking at specifically for the study. And then the black box region indicates what we would see during a flash drought event, this one during the 2012 event that I actually showed in the previous slides. And we note that we see an extremely large rapid decrease in the CSR values over a very short period of time. And that's really the characteristic um, event that we're looking at for this type of um, flash drought. Now, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm only going to be able to go through the analysis of region with the, with the winter wheat in the southern Great Plains, but I perform the same analysis as well in region two as well. For time purposes, I'm just going to focus on this one. What we note as well during this event here from 1981 to 2020 in the upper right panel, we see that there was a peak in flash drought coverage between the months of April and June. However, when looking at the bottom plot, especially with the blue colors represented of the last 20 years, we note that we see two peaks in coverage during the months of April and October. Now, these months in particular are extremely important, and I have put up here the growing season calendar of each of the three crops that we are investigating. But looking specifically at the red outline box with winter wheat, we see that October lines in sight with the planting season of winter wheat, and April lines just before the actual harvest of the crop when it's in its peak growing stage. So what we note is that the flash drought occurrence, at least during the past 20 years, is occurring at very impactful times during the growing season. And so this is gonna be really important information that we can hopefully relay off to farmers and other stakeholders who can use it to adapt their management strategies and hopefully alleviate any um, effects from these events. We then perform spatial analysis to understand how flash drought evolves over region and if specific regions as well see flash drought more compared to others. What we note is that during years such as 1993 and 1996, where we saw excessive precipitation in the region, flash drought only occurred in 5 to 10 percent of the region. But years like 2000 and 2012, which have been noted as high flash drought years, we saw upwards of three quarters of the region affected by it. The panel on the right also demonstrates the variability of the flash drought events over just the small portion of the United States. Bluer colors, especially those in the southwest portion of this domain, indicate regions that may have seen a flash drought event in about a quarter of the years, whereas regions further to the north and east actually saw flash drought events in 50, 60, upwards of 70 percent of the years in this domain. So it's very interesting to note that even just over such a small region, there is such high variability. And then this led us to our year-to-year -year analysis, where we try to understand as well, what did these flash drought events look like and how did they differ? This first plot, 1993, looks at what a year, a quiet year would look like, where little coverage of flash drought existed. 2000 is a good example of a slower progression of flash drought over the region, where we see that over a several month period of time, the initialization of flash drought occurred um, from any time from October, or I'm sorry, March all the way through um, August. And then we get to the abrupt flash drought, which is the main purpose of kind of the study moving forward, where we're looking at events that simultaneously initiate flash drought status at once and then rapidly decrease in their initialization. And to kind of investigate these abrupt flash drought events, we perform composite analysis on the anomalies of three different variables. We looked at the geopotential height anomalies, precipital water, and omega. And the reason we chose these three is they are key trends and factors with precipitation and temperature patterns in the United States and could hopefully be used to track these changes to see if what we would expect during a flash drought is occurring. And we used the composite analysis from four different events, one in 1983, one in 1992, two, one in 2003, and one in 2012. And we'll note that within each of these events, there's a clear peak of coverage in flash drought um, initialization, with the region entering anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of the entire domain going into flash drought at that one point in time. Within the 300 geopotential height anomalies, I have now the GIF going from pentad negative three in time to pentad six in time, which is essentially 15 days prior to the start of the event 
until 30 days after. And we'll note, especially here at Pentad 5 and 6, this anomalous trough off of the West Coast, which is really helping to build this ridge in place that we're seeing during the course of the event. I'll let it loop through one more time to kind of get an idea of what we're seeing here. But especially at Pentad 4 and then Pentad 5 in time here, those signals are really clear. Precipitable water anomalies are also showing some really interesting signs. The brown colors indicative of the negative anomalies, so less water vapor present in the atmosphere, show that especially at pentads two, three, four, five in time here, the United States is seeing anomalously less water vapor present in the atmosphere, likely drying out the atmosphere and keeping the conditions likely for a drought to occur. The omega anomalies, which is indicative of vertical velocity in the atmosphere. The positive anomalies are indicative of subsidence or descending motion in the region, which we're seeing across much of the southern Great Plains and Mexico in general throughout the course of the event. And this is gonna bring sinking air, which is likely to warm the air and also dry it out as well. Kind of putting it all together, I think it's really important that we look at kind of one point in time and characterize how this event might be occurring. And what we're seeing here about three weeks past the start of the initialization of the event, is this anomalous ridging or the higher height seen across the central United States coinciding with a large plume of precipitable water anomalies across much of the United States and within the same region seeing that descending motion in place. So from these four events, we're kind of getting the ingredients coming together that are likely to precondition the environment for a flash drought to occur. Now, overall, from the course of this study, there have been several different conclusions that I've been able to make. One, flash drought is a very complex event. Even over such a small domain, we were able to see that anywhere from 20 to 70% of the region, or during the course of the years, we saw a flash drought occur, which is highly variable over such a small spatial domain. Analysis has also showed that these flash drought events are very different in nature, and that there could be atmospheric precursors that could be used to um, model and see how these events are gonna change moving forward in the future. We've been using observations solely for this kind of presentation, but now that we're beginning to get signals in the height fields and precipitable waters that may show when these events are likely to occur, we could be able to start using them in models to see if models are picking out these events as well for future use for stakeholders so that they have more time to prepare. And then lastly, yeah, future work is gonna be addressing, um, including a identification of these abrupt flash drought events so that we can create a climatology of all these events in general and see if the signals in these four events are also seen in future. With that, I am so thankful to have been a part of this program and within everyone on this screen here, I would like to thank you for your help and throughout the course of the summer. And with that, I will take any questions. Great job, Ben. Amazing presentation. Um, in the future, would you be curious at looking at any other regions around the world or do you just like to focus on the United States or what's your focus for the future for regions? Absolutely, so there's actually a paper done by Jordan Christian who worked with me in this project here and he investigated, I believe it was 15 different worldwide regions of flash drought occurrence. And specifically we were focused, he was focused on those that were most impactful and pertaining um, to human growth, agriculture, and just like the worldwide life in general. So I think that um, to begin with, it would be important to also look at other regions of the United States. That's probably where I'd start, especially in the Southeast and maybe along the East Coast where I really didn't focus on for this work. And then hopefully, like you had said, expanding to other regions of the world as well with it. Yeah, good to know. Great job. Um, my question is that when you look at different years, you see different, for example, for one year, you have one peak of start date of yeah. drought. Some other years, I think mostly have two peaks. How do you explain that? Sure, so that's kind of what we're beginning to get at right now is this is the base, there hasn't really been a defined um, methodology for different types of flash drought events. In fact, I think to date there might be 100 papers on flash drought in general in total. And so because this is such a new and upcoming field, there hasn't been much that's been done within the classification of flash drought events themselves. So that's probably something that if I were gonna do future work in that I would work towards. Because we see during years such as, if I go back, in time, 2000, 
2000, one of the biggest flash drought years recorded where several studies have been done with, we know as well, like you had said, that it didn't occur over the course of like one pentad in time. We're thinking that these events are not, may not be as atmospherically driven and that more so the conditions that occur in one area could be affected over to the other. And that's why we're seeing the slower progression spatially of the flash drought in a region. I have another question. Are yep. you relating the, so you showed the start day, but do you also consider sort of the periods, the intensity, the, well, the, the, the how, long, how long did it last, for example? Yeah. So the other key thing, and I think this is a little bit easier to see with the time series of the ESR values, is that the actual flash drought event itself cuts off once we see the CSR values stop rapidly declining. So there is a certain kind of limit to what length of flash drought can be. There are times as well that, for example, if the CSR value is to remain constant, that the state of the ground would be in a drought, for example. We would say that that event has now transitioned from a flash drought to an actual long-term drought, so to say. So the flash drought itself lasts anywhere from, I believe, one to two months, usually in duration, but then can be prolonged into long-term drought afterwards. Great, thank you. So I have a question about the, the, the atmospheric conditions that lead to some of these flash droughts. Like you mentioned that there is this anomalous ridging with the substance. So how much warning do you have that that structure is going to occur, which might lead to a flash drought? Like, could you predict something like this happening a couple of days in advance, a month in advance? That's kind of crazy, but. Yeah, I think actually going back to the event that's currently occurring now, um, within Oklahoma itself, if you've been watching the weather, this area, especially the portions that are Western, Central, um, Eastern Oklahoma, they were forecasting a seven to 10 day period of temperatures of 105 to 110 degrees with little to no precipitation. So at that point in time, there was some sort of thought process that, hey, this could be the start of some form of event occurring now. There wasn't the formal, so to say, this is a flash drought and it's gonna occur and this is why, but there was more so the response of, we're thinking conditions are here where we're gonna see anomalously high temperatures, less chance of precipitation. And there's also the fact too that in this region of the country as well, we haven't seen precipitation of more than a quarter inch in almost two months. I just learned that this past weekend from my friends who visited. Um, so I think with all those conditions coming together, there was more kind of knowledge and awareness that this type of event may occur, and that hopefully in the future there's more preparedness for it too. Thank you. Real quick, so you were saying that there could be like a precursor, like if there isn't a lot of precipitation for, for yeah. a little while, that would cause this flash drought. But it wouldn't already be a drought condition, it would just become a drought, like a drought condition right. after this flash drought. One of the things that I failed to mention within the presentation, you bring a good point up, is that for a flash drought to occur, there's a set methodology that was used. And one of the criteria is that within the start of the event of looking at CSER, so kind of, if I pull up the time series through here, <coughs> the CSER value needs to be above the 40th percentile before the start of the event. And what that basically represents is saying that an event is not in a drought prior to the start of it. So if that kind of hopefully answers your question a little bit. It definitely does. And it kind of leads me to just another really quick question. Mm -hmm. Now, could droughts be like exacerbated just like a flash drought? So like if it was already a drought condition and then it just like got ultimately severe really quick, mm -hmm. is that, a, is that a, like an area of study right now? Can you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. So say there was already a drought condition, but you were seeing values ah. like this uh, CSER declining just super rapidly. So right. the drought is intensifying. Uh, is, is there any you know, research already on that? Um, not to my knowledge. I think that that would be kind of focusing in more so on like an intensifying drought and those conditions. Basically, the ground can only deteriorate as much as it can. And so once it's already in that drought state, there's only so much more that it can kind of deviate from where it was previously. The thing with the flash drought events is since it's starting in such a non-drought state, we can really exemplify and see that large change compared to what you're talking about, I think, a little bit more. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Just a comment, an observation. I found it interesting that it, it, your your events were about every ten years. 
Yeah, you know, when I was talking to Mari about that, we found it really interesting too. And we had just picked these four based on the characteristics that they encompass 20 to 30% of the region at a point in time, because yeah. they really ex exemplified what we were looking at in terms of an abrupt flash drought that spatially covers a large area. Gotcha. Thanks, Ben. Thank you.